AP History video number 45, Conflict Over the Expansion of Slavery. Hi, my name is John Linneval, and this is John Linneval Tutoring. You can reach me at john at johnlinneval.com, or you can look at my website at www.johnlinevaltutoring.com. If you like this, don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. And if you don't like ads, try testpreparation.locals.com. Cotton drives the expansion of slavery. As noted before, cotton became increasingly popular in the first half of the 19th century, which led to excessive use of land without proper crop rotation or fertilization. This desire for more fertile land, you know, that is just more land in general, and land that hadn't been worn out, that is land that was still fertile, caused farmers to demand access to lands controlled by Native Americans. This also increased the demand for slaves. And we can see the links to previous videos 40 and 41 from this series for more information. I'll put that in here when I'm doing post-production on this video. All right. Exp Expansion into Texas. Starting in the 1820s, white settlers moved from the U.S. to Texas, which was then part of Texas. Texas declared independence in Spain in 1810. Many of these settlers wanted to develop cotton plantations like those in the South. At first, Mexico was glad to have settlers to defend against raids by native tribes. Stephen Austin, like Austin, Texas, get it? led the settlers who were attracted to cheap land for farming. While Mexico allowed settlers some independence in the 1820s, by the 1830s, settlers and Mexico had problems. As in the settlers, you know, the white people who had come to Texas, kept keeping slaves even though Mexican law prohibited slavery. In the 1830s, Mexican President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana attempted to enforce these laws you know, against the settlers that the settlers routinely broke. In 1835, Texans, including the Spanish-speaking Tejanos, revolted against Texas. The Tejanos resented being ruled from Mexico City. Hmm, sounds like certain states in the U.S., you know, like basically like New York State as compared to New York City. Anyway, let's move on. Remember the animal! No, not remember the animal. Remember, remember the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. Or if you're having pie, remember the Alamo. Ha ha ha. Okay. Anyway, 200 rebel troops died at the Alamo, a former mission where the rebels attempted to shelter themselves from the Mexican troops that Santa Ana had ordered to capture or kill the rebel troops. Roughly 400 more rebel troops were killed in fighting that happened a few weeks later near the town of Goliad. Despite these initial setbacks, General Sam Houston was eventually able to lead these uh, he was eventually able to lead these rebel troops to victory. Texas became an independent republic in 1836. All right, let's move on. Growing tensions, abolitionism, and politics. As noted in the previous videos, northern abolitionists worked to end slavery in the first half of the 1800s. At the same time, Southerners saw slavery as a point of regional pride as well as a source of economic development. A minor third party, the Liberty Party, interpreted the Constitution as a declaration of liberty and equality for all U.S. citizens. This was in 1840. William Lloyd Garrison, in contrast, so he was not a liber Liberty Party, party guy. He believed that the Constitution protected slavery and thus should be rejected. I would say it's a little closer to Garrison's interpretation since it's actually explicitly detailed and set up in, in the Constitution, even though it doesn't really seem to fit with the rest talking about liberty and equality, but that's what you get when you take 
basically you take a constitution that has, says one thing and put in something that implies something completely different. You, and that's why you have this schism between the Liberty Party and William Lloyd Garrison. And if you would like more information, see video 26 to review what the Constitution said about slavery. The Liberty Party was for change through electoral politics, so elections, but Garrison was not very interested in using that method of social change since apparently he just figured, well, no, the whole system is broken. Having elections in that function inside a system that's already broken isn't going to do anything. So what do you think they should have done? That's for you to decide. Let's move on. Racism versus abolitionism. While many Northerners were racist and believed in white supremacy, the economies of Northern states did not depend on mass slavery to support the economies. Obviously, the Southern plantations depended heavily on slave labor and thus had reasons to act on white supremacist ideas in a much bigger way. These ideas made it easy to make slavery not only acceptable, but practically necessary. So there are ideas that were basically could be paraphrased as, wouldn't it be cruel not to help inferior, pe inferior people by giving them nice work? It also made the poorest whites feel connected to the wealthy plantation owners. So... It's not that different from today's racist. Oh, well, I'm poor, but hey, at least I'm not black or whatever minority they don't like. And wow, I'm just like all these wealthy people. Mm, no, not really. If you want more information on this, you can see video 19. The Lovejoy Incident. Now, we talked about so Southern racism versus Northern racism. What I do want to get across here is the northern states were not free of racial violence. For example, in 1837, a pro-slavery mob killed a newspaper publisher after previous harassment against this publisher, Mr. Lovejoy, including the destruction of his printing press three times. This was after he had already moved his press from St. Louis, Missouri, which was a slave state at the time, to Albion, Illinois, which Illinois was a free state. If you want to find out more information about it, you can click on here and you can get into the Wikipedia information here. So, you can see when I looked up, when did Mexico gain independence? Ha ha ha. Anyway. So we can see he was a Presbyterian minister, journalist, newspaper editor, and an abolitionist. So he was fatally shot after moving to Illinois from Missouri. And so this caused some problems. I mean, basically, according to John Quincy Adams, who had been the sixth president of the United States, etc., he said that this murder gave a shock of an earthquake throughout this country. And the Boston Recorder said these, uh, uh, these events caused a burst of indignation, which had not had its parallel in this country since the Battle of Lexington. Wow, that's an important battle in the Revolutionary War. And when informed about the murders, John Brown said publicly here before God in the presence of these witnesses that from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. And John Brown would of course go on to his famous raid, which didn't end up very well for him, but it definitely was an opening salvo in the war against slavery. So let's get back to this. Da, da, da. All right. So here we have Elijah. Okay, so Elijah Parrish Lovejoy was killed by a pro-slavery mob. Here's a little thing, America's story. So they have these little things here. It's a little story if you want kind of a Cliff Notes version of this. And so that's something you can look up on here. All right, let's get back to this. Da, da, da. 
Oh, yeah. So, as I said already, several important politicians decried this crime, including Illinois State Representative Abraham Lincoln. I think he got elected to some other position after that. Ha ha ha. Former President John Quincy Adams, etc. And of course, John Brown, and who would swore to dis- well, John Brown swore to destroy slavery. He raided a fort in an attempt to incite a rebellion against, you know, a rebellion by the slaves, not against the slaves, a slave rebellion where the slaves rebelled at Harper's Ferry, but unfortunately he was captured and executed. Now, the Southern Defense of Slavery. The Southerners did have a reasons, you know, they had some justification that they came up why slavery was a good thing. So, Southern slavery supporters compared Northern factory workers to slaves who weren't even fed or housed, calling them wave sla- wage slaves. So, and you can see that today, for example, this is a recent cartoon I just managed to look up using Bing, and here's... Bernie Sanders, you know, basically there are people who say, well, actually in modern day capitalism, the person who's earning a wage and is ostensibly free is actually not being paid enough and, you know, basically always facing the prospect of starving if they don't work. So, you know, so you end up with some radical things like this, like wage slavery or starvation, that's not a choice, that's a threat. And these people have a point. And this is basically the same argument used by the the South in slavery times. They weren't necessarily wrong. It's, well, if if you have no choice but to work for a company you don't like or to starve, it doesn't really matter that much if you're literally a slave or if it's just, oh, well, you're free, but you're also free to, you know, to starve. So anyway, they had a point. Um, George... Fitzhugh was a vocal critic of, in quotes, free labor that we just talked about for that reason. That is, yes, you're free to quit your job, but that also means you're free to starve. But, you know, again, if you look at the Lowell system that's in our earlier videos, basically, you know, the so-called Lowell girls who worked in textile mills, they generally were taken care of. They generally did make enough money that they could pay to live in these boarding houses. You know, they even had their own little newspaper and things like that. Anyway, it is funny to me just that an off a leftist argument, you know, somebody it sounds like something Karl Marx or Bernie Sanders would make is being used to justify white ri- white wing style oppression. I mean, slavery was literally slavery, you know, you're being forced to do something. That's something usually, uh, that's on the other spectrum, other end of the spectrum is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, just shows that you can be so conservative that you become leftist or you can be so leftist that you become uh, a right-wing fascist. You know, basically the extreme on other end, on either end, usually you leads to people being forced to do things, so you kind of end up in the same position that you don't want to be in. The Bible. The Bible was frequently used to justify slavery since slavery was approved of by the Bible. Slavery was cited as something good, as something that would train, discipline, and in quotes, civilize the slaves. So, you know, this is very similar to earlier earlier imperial colonial ideas. You know, the idea is, oh, these people are heathens. They have to be taught about our God. They have to be taught to live like us and do what we want. So it's only fair that we can force them to do all the work that we don't want to do because we're saving them and we're educating them. So, and here's a little cartoon. Stagnant wages, no overtime, no pension or benefits, irregular hours, right to work laws. Right to work laws are laws basically that say you don't have to be in a union, so they're used to bust unions all the time. If not for the sheer joy of making other people wealthy, I'd quit. Ha ha ha. So there you go. You've got a wage slave who's very happy being a wage slave here. 
Let's move on. Okay, so we have the biblical defense of slavery. Let's go over this for a second. So first we have the book of Genesis, and this is all on this website that I found. So here we go. Da, da, da. All right, the book of Genesis says, Curse be to Canaan. To Canaan. The servant of Sir shall be unto his brethren and he said to blessed be the lord of god shem and canaan shall be his servant so this is talking about the curse of ham some people talk about africans as the hamites and so ham and his brothers had seen noah in a drunken state with no clothes while two of the brothers tried to cover up noah ham did not so because ham was acting a little weird that way he was cursed and so he got to be a slave so the descendants of cain were thought to be the africans and thus the servants of servants etc so because of these original sins so to speak the hamites or hamites were the you know were the african americans the well just africans who were thought of as slaves and deserving as such i am not saying that i believe any of this i don't but obviously this is one of the things that they believed in these things so let's clear out a couple of these da, da, da. all right the book of leviticus all right let's take a look at leviticus here so leviticus has all sorts of really interesting things if you're wondering where the prohibition on sodomy etc you know things that are used to harass gay people that's here too um, also some of the kosher dietary things so you know if you eat ham anything from a pig any shell you know shellfish then you really shouldn't take this as advice or as guidance but anyway if we look at that okay it says here that both your bondman and your bondmaids, which you shalt have, shall be of the heathen which are around you. Okay, so these are the people who are the heathens. Get it? These are the people who weren't out, you know, weren't from your country. They weren't taught in your religion. So, you know, and it talks about, okay, you shall buy in the families that are with you and that are begat in your land, okay? So you can buy them as long as, the, and if they're raised in your country, etc. Yeah, okay, so that's the next thing. Now, if we move on to the next thing, which is da, 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 the New Testament. In the New Testament, what we have here is we're dealing with the epistle of Paul to Philemon. Yeah, so there's a letter from Paul to Philemon. I know in the, in the Bible when they talk about letters, especially from Paul, you know, as comedians, you know, it always sounds like, Hi, Philemon, how are you? I am doing fine. This is your pal Paul. You know, anyway, but okay, with that lame joke. Uh, so Paul explained that Philemon's slave, one you must. One of us, I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't know. We'll just say one of us. If you know how to pronounce it, please let me know. Anyway, had run to refuge in Rome and Rome. One of us. Okay, he doesn't co. <laughs> That's funny. It says it. He cones across Paul. No, he comes across Paul and hears him speaking. And then one of us is asked to be baptized. And then he tells Paul where he came from. And Paul tells one of us he has to return to his master and then he does that because that's what the bible tells him to do so you know therefore that's going to be the justification for slavery in you know, our whatever in u.s history and anywhere else where you had a christian pop population that wanted to justify slavery all right so there's some other arguments here 
So, another popular argument among slavery defenders was that if slavery was so immoral, then why did it exist at all at the time of Jesus Christ? Since slavery and servitude are specifically mentioned throughout the New Testament, um, especially during the time of the Son of God, you know, that being Jesus, it was it clearly existed, and, well, why wouldn't Jesus have done something about it? Roman slavery was popular at this time, and Jesus said nothing against it. And another argument was that nowhere in the Bible does it say that those who own slaves would not be permitted into the kingdom of he heaven. And since immoral people would definitely be not allowed into heaven, then people who are allowed it in by simple logic must not be immoral people. So, if it doesn't say that in the Bible, then slave owners couldn't possibly be immoral. And another argument is, okay, it talks about Abraham. We all know about Abraham from the Bible. The defenders of slavery use one story where Abraham and Hagar, no, I don't mean the cartoon Viking or Sammy Hagar, ha ha ha. Basically, Hagar was a slave to Sarah, who was Abraham's wife. He sent by Sarah to get pregnant by Abraham, since Sarah has been unable to give him a child. So Hagar, okay, I get it. Hagar was a female. It's a woman, okay. And so, but then when Hagar gets pregnant, Sarah gets upset, and because of this unhappiness, Hagar runs away, feeling as though she's to blame for. Sarah's sadness, and while running away, an angel appears to Hagar, tells her she has to return to her master. So, much like Wondemus, they're saying, well, because obviously God thinks slavery is okay, then someone who is a slave must have to go on and just basically... Well, as the kids would put it, or at least when I was a kid, put it, have to suck it up and deal, man. Or in this case, suck it up and deal, woman, you know. You had a baby with, sure, you had a baby with your owner, and she wasn't cool with it, but, you know. Hey, of course, a little more rational argument would be, you were forced to go and do this. The fact that the woman who forced you to do this had second thoughts and got upset with you, that really shouldn't be your problem. That should be her problem, and she never had any, to, any right to own you in the first place. But that's my opinion, and I think that's most rational people's opinion. So let's move on. Thomas R. Dew. Okay, so let's look at Thomas R. Dew here. This is all in the same website. All right, so after Nat Turner's rebellion in the state of Virginia came to discuss the possibility of eventually eliminating slavery in Virginia. Hey, they're onto something. So Thomas Dew wrote in the review of the debate in Virginia, in the Virginia legislation of 1831 to 1832 in which he made a pace, made a case I should say against emancipation in this review drew it acknowledges that slavery goes against the spirit of Christianity however slavery had been established by God himself so in order to understand the institution of slavery as a moral practice do argue that you only had to look at the Bible okay so this is basically more of an argument based on the Bible, and so he fought for it based on religion, and he also said, okay, also made the argument that it was a better alternative than the other, that, well, so basically we're talking about slaves wouldn't be able to make it on their own, and that African Americans and whites would not be able to live peace, peacefully with each other. So this was another argument basically using the Bible and Christianity and interesting social, I don't know, social services, uh, should we say, arguments here. So yeah, we always get some interesting things here. So I'm not going to go back to the main page. Let's just go to this next one. Joseph Wilson. All right, so Joseph Wilson, he went on and he said, but look, okay, but ought, okay, I guess, but some people ought look forward to the time when African slaves will all be what the Bible would make them, a race 
whose love for the master above them will spread their rejoicing millions of... Se- uh, uh, ma- <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. This is written in kind of old-fashioned English here. Okay. But ought the... Ought look make for... Ought look forward the time when the African slaves... Okay, I get it. So this is not normal normal word order. Anyway, so what they're saying here is the African slaves ought to look forward to the time that they'll be able to see what God wanted them from the Bible. They want them to become a race whose love of the master above will spread their rejoicing millions, a measure of sanctification which will convert their services into the very first of home blessings and their piety into a missionary influence for saving the black man everywhere from the ruin of of perdition. Perdition. Perdition means loss, you know, basically. So... Really fancy, old-fashioned language for, oh, okay, well, you should just look forward to being redeemed in the next life, and you will be rewarded by being able to rejoice and feel that you've been sanctified, made holy by by God, by the Master, presumably Master, capital M, so they mean God. Um... All right, and it talks here at the bottom here. Joseph Wilson went farther than other biblical defenders of slavery by saying that slavery was actually saving African Americans. So, Wilson's and everybody, all right, so this is the same argument that, well, all right, if you're a slave, you become a better Christian, and since you were serving other people, you learn from experience how to, how do I put it? Well, how to serve and how to learn about how to be a good Christian. And that would also teach them a proper master-slave relationship. All right. That was a little tough for me to get through, both because of the way it was written and because of, wow, very high BS quotient there, in case you haven't figured out from my tone of voice on this. But, let's move on. The Mudsill Defense of Slavery. The basic idea is that some people are just inferior and made for menial labor. The Mudsill was the lowest part of a house which was beneath the foundation. The lowest workers in the southern plantation economy was, of course, these lowest workers were the slaves. And they made the metaphorical mudsill of the antebellum south economically and socially. So if we look at this diagram here that I found on Bing, basically, okay, we can see the sill plate. So that's like the mudsill. The difference, I believe, is just... In a lot of places where they don't have basements or foundations like this, you know, there's certainly no basement in many parts of the South and California, etc. They just have literally dirt on the bottom. That is the mud sill rather than this sill plate. And under the sill, whether it's a sill plate or a mud sill, you have the floor joist, the subfloor, the floor plate, etc. So you can see this whole assembly that makes the actual floor that you're standing on has to be on top of the earth or the mud sill. So the idea is, is this human mud sill would save people time and effort for more productive people to do things that are more productive and more unusual skills than, you know, the idea is, okay, we don't really need electrical engineers and doctors and the best teachers, etc., to be busy mopping floors when you can hire somebody else to mop floors and there are so many people who know how to mop floors you can just say okay look we've got somebody who doesn't know how to do anything else we can't train them to do anything else just give them a bucket and mop and we'll pay them some money and then 
the best teachers and the best doctors and the best lawyers and the best engineers can actually do things that are way more productive. That way, everybody is doing the thing they're best at and we have the best economy. That part is perfectly fine. And then you can say, oh, okay. And then there's this explanation that's in South Park. I'll show you this now. And in order for a society to thrive, we need gods and clods. Gods and clods? Yes. You see, I spent a lot of time going to law school, and I was able to go because I have a slightly higher intellect than others. But I still need people to pump my gas and make my french fries and fix my laundry machine when it breaks down. Oh, I see. Gods and clods. That's right. So Kenny's family is happy just the way they are, and we're all a functioning part of America. So you can see from there, they're all excited. But if you watch that episode of South Park, if you haven't already, it goes awry. Because once you start deciding that certain people by their economic status, their racial heritage, their nationality, etc., that some people are just automatically gods or clods based on some characteristics that they can't change... You know, some, fine. If you're not intelligent enough or you don't have the instincts, whatever, to be able to develop ways to to develop your skills, you're probably going to have to be part of the lower class. But many people who have been raised by lower class people actually have made it out of poverty, etc. That's the story of my family. It's probably the story of many of the people who are watching this video. So you don't want to just decide that entire races of people or groups of people are inferior and should be relegated to jobs that are really, really awful. Obviously, mudsill mud or clod status based on race, slave, etc. status ignores facts common sense, and morality. All right, Congress and slavery. The Senate was much more supportive of slavery than the House of Representatives. The idea is the Senate had and still has only two senators per state. Doesn't make a difference if it's the state with the largest population, like California, or the one with the smallest population, which I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's Rhode Island. Maybe it's Montana. Whatever. Anyway. They're definitely generally going to be rural states that have small populations, but guess what? By the way the Constitution is set up, they get two senators just like the biggest states do. So, rural states get the same senatorial votes as uh, urban states. What does that do? Well, that means that... The rural states certainly are going to have more influence in the Senate than they would in the House because the House is based on population. So that is, as more people move into the high population states, they get more representatives. So back in those days of slavery, the northern states with more people had much more power in the house because they got to add representatives. But since slavery wasn't as nearly important in the north, there was no real reason that northern representatives would support slavery. However, going back to the Senate, well, basically all the southern senators supported slavery because that was the big industry there, was agricultural, specifically cotton agriculture that needed slaves. And those slave owners, they owned the, you know, the plantations. The plantations practically, literally fed the mouths of the, of the senators. You know, that's where their clothes came from. That's where the agricultural products they needed came from. And certainly the money, hey, the money was coming from these plantation owners. And of course, the votes, where did the votes come from? Well, the votes came from people who lived and own, lived on and owned these plantations, mostly the people who owned them, the people who lived on them, the slaves didn't get to vote. Anyway, so, if you want to see more about this, you can look at video number 26. Did you find this video useful? 
If you did, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why? Well, it's really simple. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of view time. I do, however, have a thousand subscribers, actually a few more than that. Thank you so much. That's really awesome. But please, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do because I can always use more people. Ad money will help me make more videos. If you saw an ad during this video, and you probably did, please know that I didn't get any of the ad money and won't until I have the subscribers and view time that YouTube dem demands. So, for the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I will gladly read, and I do gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for the new videos. I do reserve the right to delete comments such as troll posts or spam. And you can hire me for tutoring either online or if you are in the California... San Francisco Bay Area, I can meet with you in person and sometimes even in other areas of the country if, or out of the country even and if I'm going to be traveling there. So on that note, thank you so much for watching and there's just a little bit more after this. Here's how to contact me. You can reach me at facebook.com forward slash Linabal Tutoring. You can reach me on Instagram at john.linabal.tutoring. And my phone number is 415-623-4251. That's a cell phone, so you can even text message me. There's my email. There's my website. Both of these go to the same place. So whichever you like, John Linabal or John Linabal Tutoring. And testpreparation.locals.com. I'm also on LBRY, short for Library TV, and that's another way to see things if you don't want to use YouTube. And there's my mailing address if you want to send me mail. You're more than welcome to. And just remember, this video is based on Barron's AP U.S. History Review Book, 4th Edition. I'm aware there's a 5th Edition. I do have it, but I'm using the 4th Edition for right now. Anyway, do not use these videos as a substitute for your classes, your text, etc. While I'm sure this will help you do really well on the U.S. History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please read your class text and pay attention to what your teacher has to say, and that way you will do well on your school tests as well as the UP. U.S. History for AP, or the AP U.S. History exam, I should say. All right, hope you're having a good day. Bye.